<laughs> Hi, guys. How are you doing? Good? Yeah. Good, okay. Well, I am up here today because I'm going to bring the conclusion to our series, uh, No Regret Living, right? And Pastor Andy has been talking to you the past couple of weeks, and uh, he's encouraging us to live life to its fullest, right? To live it out passionately and completely and to live it out humbly. Well, today I want to talk to you about also being able to uh, lead boldly, right? When it, time comes for us to have to depart this world, that we are able to do it with confidence, that we're able to lead boldly, okay? Now, before I jump into my message, let me uh, just pray over this message and the congregation that's here. All right, so bow your heads with me. Thank you, Father. Yes. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and that you would fill every nook and cranny of this room. Father God, we ask that the spiritual authority in here would be none but Jesus Christ himself, that your spirit would descend upon your people, that you would open our hearts up to hear the message that you have. Father, I know these folks matter to you. I know that you love them, Father. And so this word, Father, I ask that you would... Uh, just massage it into their hearts, Father, and help them to understand the freedom behind what you have for them. Now, I thank you, Father, that you delight in using the weak things in life to bring about your, your power and your truth. So I ask humbly, Father, that you would just fill in the gaps and that this message can bring you glory. I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, guys, you know, uh, as I was contemplating on this message, right, le uh, leaving boldly, um, I was thinking about something that took place in our home, the Meads home, back in, um, let's see, July, the towards the beginning of July. We actually had the COVID hit our home. Yeah, right? I thought if we got COVID, it would come in through me since I'm, or Andy, since we're so active with the community, but it didn't. It came in through my youngest son, who's an adult, 23, right? And uh, he told me that I could tell the story today, but uh, Anyway, it came in through him, and what made it so remarkable is that he's the, he's the son that is an introvert. <laughs> he's the son that is a homebody, doesn't really go anywhere, right, and stuff. But uh, anyway, it hit our home, and uh, primarily David, and so he went into self-quarantine. But, you know, I remember when he got that diagnosis, and it came rolling our way, and it just really sparked fear in my heart because I'm like you. I watch the news, and I see what's going on. And I really thought, oh my gosh, right? What about my young son? What would happen to him? And uh, I thought about his life. He had good survival, but, you know, what, what would this mean for him? And then I thought about my mom, who's 85, right? I love her dearly. I'm with her every week, helping to take care of her. She still lives independently, but I'm always there. And so I thought about her and the protection that I had been trying to provide for her during the pandemic, right? And then I thought about my staff and you guys, and, and my heart broke. And then I thought about, you know, just myself. I'm old, <laughs> right? I like to admit it, but I am. And I have asthma, and I thought, oh, Lord, right? And for the moment that I heard that, I could feel that my heart was racing, and it was, uh, uh, oh, gosh, wrestling with, fe with the fear, right? The fear of death, of the unknown, and so in that wrestling place, I thought, that how many times things like that come upon us that are unexpected, that we didn't know would be here, and, and yet they are here, right? And so today I want to talk to you about leaving boldly, because I know that it is appointed to man to die once. That means, I'm going to say this with 100% certainty, all of us will die, right? It's just a matter of when, when it happens. And so this is going to be an important message for you because I do think that you can leave boldly, okay, that you can leave with confidence this life. And so I believe that choices we make here and now will impact that greatly. And so we need to be able to understand what Scripture tells us about leaving boldly. So if you pull your outline out, I'm going to talk to you about it today. And so the first thing that I see when I study Scripture is that we need to know where we're going, we need to know where we're going. Our Jesus showed us uh, how to live, right? He knew he was going to die, and he, was, he did it willingly, and he did it with all boldness because he knew where he was going. Take a look at this scripture in John 13. It says, this was just before the Passover feast, right? And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his father. 
So again, assurance, he knew where he was going. We need to know where we're going, right? And this, and this helps to breed the confidence. It helps to be able to lead boldly when we know that, right? So this got me thinking about a story I heard a long time ago about uh, Albert Einstein. Most of you know who he is, right? Great scientist of the 19th century, the early 19th century. Well, he was going on a trip one day, and so he was catching a train to go to this engagement. And uh, the conductor was coming through the car, and as they used to do, they would take their tickets and they would punch them, right? And so he comes upon Albert Einstein, and he says, ticket, please. You know, and Albert was known for his forgetfulness, right? That brilliance, but he's still very forgetful. And he's like patting down, where did I put it, right? He just didn't know where the heck his ticket was. Now, the conductor looked at him, and he bent over, and he said, you know, Mr. Or Dr. Einstein, what do you call him? Dr. Einstein, I know who you are, and I'm sure you bought a ticket. It's okay. Don't worry about it, right? And so uh, he, the conductor walked on, continuing to punch the tickets, and before he left that car that day, he turned back around to look to make sure he got everybody, and he saw uh, Einstein, right? Albert was down on the floor looking terribly for his ticket just everywhere, and the conductor had compassion. He walked over him, and he bent over, and he said, Dr. Einstein, don't worry about it. I know who you are. And so Dr. Einstein was down there, and he looked at him, and he goes, young man, I know who I am. I just don't know where I'm going, <laughs> right? There's this momentarily like, oh, my gosh, where am I going? We each and every one of us have it. You know, I can remember, I can remember when I was a newer Christian, and uh, they asked me, so I had somebody ask me, are you going to heaven? And I thought, oh, well, I don't know, right? I mean, I know Jesus, but I don't know. And so because of my Catholicism I've been taught, I thought you couldn't know that for sure until you died and stood before the Lord, right? And he judged your life. Like, I, I used to think God had this, like, scale, right? And he put all the bad stuff on one side <laughs> and all the good stuff on the other. And if the good stuff outweighed the bad stuff, well, gosh, I got to go to heaven. But if that bad stuff, right, tilted those scales, then a trap door would open, and I'd fall right down to hell, right? I kind of thought that in my mind. And I, you know, that was, I just thought you couldn't know if you were going to heaven until you were actually standing before God. Then I started to read scripture. Now look what I found. It says here in uh, 1 John 5, 11 through 13, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son, who is Jesus Christ, in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Look at this. This is why it's written to you and I, the believers. Watch this. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may what? know that we may know that we have eternal life and so john knew our propensity was that we would be fearful right that that we would be uncertain and so he's going to give us this scripture to help to sure us up right now just as sure as this scripture i know that culture our culture today our culture teaches us all kinds of wacky things about eternity <laughs> right and portrays it in a, a number of ways, and it brings confusion. But I want you to know that you are designed, you were created in the image of God, so you are created for eternity, right? You were created for eternity, and so that's the reality that you need to grab hold of and push back from the culture that would tell you otherwise. You were created for eternity. Now, just last year, I got a fresh reminder of eternity, right? I had two events that, that took hold that I want to share with you today to help clear up some things. The first one was uh, when I had gone to the hospital uh, to visit one of our pastor kids who had surgery, and I went late at night so I could just go in and out, right, and stuff. But coming down, I was with Pastor Andy, coming down out of the elevator, I ran into some of the young adults that actually come to this church. And uh, as I ran into them, uh, they were so, so glad to see us. And the young girl, whom I love dearly, she was sharing with me how her father had, uh, had come into the hospital a month earlier and how she was praying for him to be well, right? Now, here you go. All three, her brother, herself, and her mom, all three of them came here, gave their life to Christ over the past couple of years, but not the father. And so she was telling me about her dad 
and uh, said that his body now had uh, went septic. And so the medical community was saying, you need to pull him off the life support. But she was telling me, she said, Sharon, I really, I really struggled with this because, you know, does that mean I don't have enough faith if I, if I allow them to take him off the, you know, the ventilator and stuff like that? And so I was sitting there with her. I said, no, not at all. You know, it's our good pleasure that God puts on us and with us that we get the honor of praying for people's healings, but it's God who decides whether the healing takes place or not, right? It's God's decision, and God isn't limited by a ventilator or a life support system. If he's going to do it, he's going to do it, right? So anyway, after talking with her and the family, they talked, and they decided they were going to go ahead and um, sign the papers for him to be pulled off, and she asked, if, uh, if we would go up there with them, and I said, absolutely. So Andy stayed with the family where they're signed in, and I went in. I stood at this man's bed, you know, the end of the bed, and I looked at him, and I, I thought all the times I had seen him at Christmas and at Easter or when there was a special event, and I realized that he had never given his life to Christ, right? And I just looked, and I thought, oh, my gosh, Lord. And so my heart was heavy when I was, when I was standing there. Well, the, uh, the medical crew came in, and they start to pull the life support system from him. And uh, like, like uh, yeah, like they thought it, he was just going to die. But he did not. He actually woke up from the sedation, from being intubated, right? And he woke up, and he was conscious. And I tell you what, I'll never forget the sight, because he was terrified. He was absolutely terrified because he knew in his self that his body was dying, right? And just absolute terror in his face, and he began to moan and thrust about, right? And the wife was standing there. She looked at him. She goes, Pastor Sharon, right? Can you not do anything? And I, and I looked at her, and I said, yes, I believe this is why God brought me here today, right? And so I walked right over. I grabbed hold of his hand. I looked him dead in the eye. He looked like a man that was drowning, drowning, right? Just absolutely drowning. And I looked at him and I recounted with him the message that I have given so often from this stage about who Jesus Christ is, about salvation. And then I looked at him and I said, do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior right now? And he managed to moan and say, yes. And he shook his head, right? I know, it's so exciting. So I prayed for him. So I prayed for him. And then I noticed after I prayed for him, the calmness started to come upon him. He closed his eyes. The nurse came in. They shot him full of morphine, right, to, to just bring his, you know, to put him back in the coma is what happened. And then he went and he was sleeping there. Now, the family was, um, needed to get composure after what they had just saw. So they walked back out in the hall. Pastor Andy's in the hall. And so I'm standing there at the bedside, right, talking to the Lord and praying. And what do I see? Over to the left hand, I cannot forget this because it was so intense. Over to the left-hand side, in the corner, I saw like a haze, a light, right? It was just a hazy thing, and I thought, oh, Sharon Mead. It was one in the morning. I thought, you are really tired. <laughs> Great woman of faith, right? I thought, what the heck? And you know what happened? That family came back in, and the man began to labor in his breathing, right? And then I saw the haze of light come over the man's bed, over at the top of his head, and it sat there, right? And I was just thinking, oh, my gosh, what is this? And then uh, as that was going on and the man was labor breathing, the nurse came in at one point because his breath didn't come back to him, and she came in or he came in to tell us perhaps that he had died. But I heard the other nurse on the other side saying, wait, 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 he's still with us, right? And so they left, and the light was still there, and then all of a sudden... This light came right over the man and touched him like that. And then it left. And I thought, he's not here. And about 30 seconds later, the nurse came in and said, he's now gone. He's now gone, right? Now, I tell you, it was so intense what I saw. I didn't know how to verbalize it. I got in the car that night to go home with Andy. I'm like, did you see that light? <laughs> he goes, no, I, I was so fixated on trying to help the family, Sharon. I'm like, oh, I just, have to, I just have to think about this. So the next day, uh, I'm programmed well because I get up real early in the morning to do my devotions and my Bible reading. 
So I got up, got my coffee, opened my Bible to where I was the day before, and it was right in the, uh, the Word where it starts talking about how the Apostle Paul was put in jail, right in this deep, dark jail with no light, no nothing, and then the angel of light came in to guide him out of prison. And at that moment, I heard, I heard the Holy Spirit say, that's what you saw. You saw the light, right, which is what Christ does for us, right? And that light, and then it dawned on me, you see these young people that were praying for their father to be healed? God actually answered their prayers, maybe not like they thought, right? But you see, he, he made sure I stopped by because he knows I got a tenacity about me when it comes to this. And so he made sure I was standing there, right, at the right time. And he brought him out of, um, you know, being unconscious to consciousness so that he could hear yet one more time about the gospel and get his life right, right? And then in his love and kindness, he brings an angel to take him home, right? Now, I tell you what, this story so rattled me inside because it sealed that we are eternal beings, right? And this man, when I seen the fear in his eyes, I don't want any of you to ever experience that. No one here can ever experience that as far as my um, ability to tell you to beware, to be able to, to make sure you've, you've adequately know where you're going, right? You know, the second event I told, wanted to tell you about was a gal who, who is part of our dream team here, right? She says, really sweet. She's a little younger than me. Anyway, she contracted a disease, a terminal disease. And when she was in the last months of this disease, uh, she went into hospice. And uh, I was called to go over and spend some time with her. So I was talking about, uh, you know, any funeral arrangements that she might want and stuff like that. And uh, when I was talking to her, I was struck by the peace that which she talked in it. She was so at ease. Even though she was in a lot of pain, she talked with such peace, right? And then when I went to pray for her, I held her hand, and again, I could see the peace of Christ. Again, I could see the confidence, right? She knew. She knew what she knew, right? And so we prayed that day, and I prayed for her, and then I, I remember letting go of her hand and, and saying goodbye to her. And as I got up to walk, she said, Pastor Sharon, I said, what? She goes, I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> right? I'll see you on the other side. This woman didn't just know about eternity. She knew. Right? She knew from the heart and from the gut. And she had boldness. And when she left, she left with boldness. Now, this hearkens the question for you. If you have even a little smidgen inside of you and you don't know about, you know, eternity and where am I going you want to answer that today, right? I will give you an opportunity at the end of the time I'm talking with you uh, to pray with me, to give your life to Christ. And if you're uncertain, then you do it again. And you do it again until you become certain of this, right? Because we want you to know what you know. And so we can't leave boldly unless we do that. The second reason I believe that woman could leave boldly is the next point I want to show you up here is that she could leave because she knew she'd build her life on things that last, that went beyond her life. You and I need to build our life on things that last, right? We need to build them that go beyond our time here on earth. So I was thinking about this concept. It's like, how do I, how do I communicate this? And then it struck me. You know, so many times living here in Virginia Beach that I have taken my children to the oceanfront, right? And probably, perhaps, many of you, and uh, we've, we've built sand castles with our children right at the water's edge, right? Andy and I used to love to build. He would build one with some of the boys. I'd build the other one to see which one was more grand, right? And then to no avail, though, because the tide would come in, and guess what? Wash it completely away. Not even a trace, right? I got to thinking, there are many of us who are, are taking our lives and we're building sandcastles, okay? That you're building sandcastles. And so I want to call out to you, I want to shout out to you to be able to stop and to think about this because Jesus himself knows that we have a propensity to build sandcastles with our lives and so he wants to call us into alignment with him. Look what he says here in this scripture in Matthew 7, 24 through 28. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, is like the wise man who built his house on the 
rock. That's right, on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, like the foolish man who builds his house on the sand, this is sandcastle building, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it, and, and it fell with a great crash. What I want you to see here is there's a warning to us. You see, death comes to all of us, right? The rain, the different things in life, they come to each and every one of us, right? And those that have built upon a rock, which is Jesus Christ, that we follow his principles as opposed to building sandcastles, following the culture is really what that is. Depending on how we build, it has huge ramifications on us, right? Now, just in case you don't understand this, let's take a look at the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. This is what he says. He gives us appearing into eternity here. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly stone, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, right? And the fire will test the quality, the quality of each person's work. If what he has built survives, the builder will receive a reward. That means there's something that's given to us for spending our life the way he says so, right? If it is burned up, the builder will, look at this, this is amazing, will suffer loss, yet will he be saved. This is the power of the cross. This is the power of the cross, right? Yet you will be saved because it's on Jesus Christ's name that we are saved. It is by grace, not by works. That is what it's talking about. But the rewards is talking about how we do things here on this earth. So there is a measure of judgment that happens. We will be saved, even though he has escaping through the flames. So what we see here is we see a depiction of what happens in eternity. That's actually what's going on here, right? And so the Apostle Paul, he's talking to him, he's saying, hey, listen, this will be important now. Hey, listen, right? When you close your eyes here and you die here, what happens is you open them up and you stand between, you know, before the God Almighty, right? The, the God of the universe, the God that made you, the God that made everything, right? And little old you, you stand right in front of him because you have to give an account of your life. That's what the word says. So you stand right in front of him. But before God says anything, before you say anything, what's just going to happen to you is this arm's going to come around you, right? It's going to pull you in close, and that's the arm of Jesus Christ. And so before you can say anything, he'll say, Father God, I died for her. Father, I forgave him his sins. Father, he is one of us. That's what gets said, right? And then you're going to hear Father God say, well done. Come on in. Come on into eternity, right? This is the depiction that we have that happens when we die. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, if you reject Jesus Christ, you still stand before him, but you are standing all alone because you've rejected Christ's help. And you stand in judgment. You have to give an account of all that you've done in your life. And I don't know about you, but that's not going to bode well, right? I, I couldn't get into heaven without Jesus. It's not going to bode well, so you don't want that. Matter of fact, I feel so impassioned about this. It's what drives me. Matter of fact, you guys were given that uh, little flyer, you know, that when you came in, right, that Pastor Samuel showed you, right? Pull that thing out. I want you to look at it. You see that piece right there that was created? It was created because there are many people in your sphere of influence, right? And they are lost. They do not have Christ. This is your invite card. Please, please, for their sake, give it to them, right? The Lord will show you. Because he loves all people. And so he'll show you who to give it to, right? And so I want to encourage you to use that at this time, to, to ask the Lord, who do I give that to? Now, guys, it's important for us uh, to be able to, to understand that we have ramification. So when we stand before the Lord and he says, come on in, it doesn't just end there. That's where this scripture really starts to open up for us right? Because what's going to happen is Jesus is going to walk you to another place. 
And right there with a big cloud of witnesses, which are believers, which are the saints, which are you guys, what's going to happen is your whole life gets displayed. And Jesus will measure not just your actions, but your motives, right? And they'll be on display for him to do that. Now, let me assure you of one thing. What will not be on display? Every sin, everything you did wrong that you asked for forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, right? That will not be displayed. Why? Because the scripture tells us that when we ask for forgiveness, he takes our sins and he puts them as far from the east as to the west. That means he remembers them no more. So they will not be displayed. But every deed, every, every action that we had, every you know, inclination of what we did and why we did it, that will be displayed and will be measured. And there are six different things that it's going to measure. It's going to have three that will, you know, that will be tested and go through the fire of Jesus' um, you know, judgment and that will pass. And there will be three that will not. Right? So the three that we see that are going to be able to make it through the fire, it's talked about as gold. It's talked about as silver and precious gems. Now, I'm a pretty practical girl, right? So let me give you an explanation what those three might be, right? I believe those, the, uh, the gold and the silver, I believe they're wrapped up with you and I. I believe that if we would give the effort to figure out how God has shaped us, right? He's given you a shape, not just physically, but he's given it to you spiritually too. So in discovering your shape, you understand the spiritual gifts he's given you. You understand the passions that you have that are from him. You understand about the abilities he's given you, not just for making money, right, and having a career, but he's given you special talents and abilities, and he wants you to know those and to be able to use those for his kingdom. And then he's wired you up a certain way, right? And you need to know why did he make me an introvert? Why did he make me an extrovert? Not one good, one bad, but just understanding how he shaped you, right? And then he's given you experiences, this is going to be important. He's allowed you to be born in this time, in this era. For such a time as this, he wants to use your life. And so when you understand that you've been born into this situation right now, and you take your shape and you yoke it to Jesus Christ, to what his word says, then all of a sudden you're able to walk out your purpose in life. It begins to make sense. It's not hard, right? And so you need to be able to understand that. And when we walk in our purpose, we produce gold. We produce that silver. And the precious gems that it talks about, those precious stones, what that is, is those are relationships. Those are relationships God's given you, right? Well, what do you mean? Well, that's your wife, that's your husband, that's your kids, that's your moms and your dads, right? It's all the people that are in this audience. It's all your friendships. These are what God has given you. And he puts a high premium on them. And how we interact with one another, that goes through the fire. And hopefully it produces these beautiful gems. So you see, these are the three things that, that are going to be able to go through the fire. Again, I'd be remiss if I didn't look at the last three, right? Those last three, those hay, the, the wood, the stubble, that's not going. What are those things? Well, I would I'd put it this way. I think it's when we take our cues from the culture and we decide to run after possessions, you know, a better retirement, a bigger home, a better car, you know, nicer clothes. When we go after the possessions, gimme, 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 I think that is one of them. The other one is prestige. You know, let me impress you. I, I need to make sure you know I'm, I'm great, I'm cool, and so I want to be very woke, to take a word they're using, right? And so I care about the culture so much and following its lead, right? Because I want to impress people. I, I, I believe that's truth, and I need to run after that. And then the other one I was thinking about is power. How we seek out power, that we elevate ourselves. It's me, myself, and I, right? We lift ourselves up, and we subjugate people to us, right? These are the things I believe that are the, you know, that are the things that will not make it through the fire. They'll be burned up, Right? So we have to be very careful, very mindful that we don't trail off into doing that. Now, here you go. As a pastor, I know that the reality is that each and every one of you are going to stand before the Lord. I know that. And so I'm going to tell you the why behind the what I do here at this church. It's the what 
that you, you get to see the what, but here's the why I just explained. The what you see is I really, I really take a lot of time, all of us pastors, to try to get you to go through growth track, right? Why do we do that? Because in growth track, this is the beginning of being able to discover your shape. Where you come in, you find a family. You begin to see how God has formed you. You begin to, to uh, yoke yourself up with other people, right? To be able to make a difference. You begin to step out and walk out that, that thing that God has for you in your life. And then you see here at this church, we pound small groups, right? We talk about them all the time. Why? Well, not only are they places that you learn how to cultivate those special gems in your life, is, isn't it there that we encourage one another, that we do life together, that we are able to encourage and be encouraged? We're able to talk about our difficulties and have somebody come alongside us and help us? You see, small groups is one of these things that's so terribly, terribly important. And if you are with listening to my voice today, I'm going to encourage you to go to the directory there to be able to look at all the different ones that we have and find one. And not just for you. If you have kids in here, listen. We've got the very best teachers that are coming forward so that children can have a small group during that 90-minute window that we have our small group, all right? And the youth, the next-gen youth, have put together some fantastic things and the college age, right? And so we're, we're going over the top, making sure that we have all these things for you. We're offering here at this church on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and on Thursday. And I talked to my online audience, and we've got a whole bunch of Zooms for them because they're not able to come back into the building yet, right? Why am I going to all this trouble? Because these are the things, these are the places that will help to cultivate inside of you the gold, the silver, that will tell you don't, don't fall for these other things, the hay, the stubble, the, you know, the wood, those are no good, right? That's what's going to happen in these groups. And so I unapologetically will come up and I'll say, you've got to do this. This is something that's really, really important, right? And I push the lever here. I push the lever. Why do I push the lever? Here you go, especially harder today than I ever have, because I, again, like you, I listen to the news. Of course, to get the truth, i got to go to five stations, right? <laughs> That's supposed to be a joke. It's actually true. It's sad. Here you go. So the point being here, though, is that our culture we live in, they have relegated the church to something that's not important. Non-essential is how they put it. It's non-essential. And I would, I would say to you, that is a lie. It is very, very essential. You see, the church is not the building. The church is the connection of people, right? It's what makes us strong. It's what builds our faith. We have to have church. In other words, we have to have each other. So I'm going to say that loudly, and I say it clearly so that you know. And the pushback is that we get so afraid of the virus or we get so concerned that we, we pull back into our own little corner, and it's in that place that you could die spiritually, right? It's not a good place, so you want to make sure you push in and, uh, and, and take those next steps needed. Now, when we boil all this down, right, what am I saying here? What lasts into eternity? This is the scripture I always quote to you guys. Ready? Okay. It's to love the Lord your God. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And it's to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, there's only two things. Your purpose will look different, each one of you, but there's two things that God's going after. One is to love him with all that we possibly are, right? With our whole entire shape. And, you know, the only way we can do that is if we understand his word, if we're with people that encourage us to keep going that way. And the second is to love people, right? Not to get offended by them or what they say, right? But just to love them. Love them like Christ did, who laid down his own life for us. That's how we're to love people. Those are the two things that go into eternity. Those are the things that are, that are really going to make a difference in your life and in mine. Now, after hearing this, you go, that's pretty intense, Sharon. <laughs> right? Or you can go, gosh... I wonder what this means for me, right? I wonder what this means for me. You see, just like COVID came into my home unexpectedly, death comes into our home unexpectedly. 
And so I want you to be ready. And so, again, if you've, you're in here and you don't know with 100% certainty, I am going to be able to stand before the Almighty God and have his hand around me, you know, Jesus, then, then you'll want to be praying with me in just a moment to accept that, that gift of salvation and that make that relationship. And if you're in here and you're thinking, hmm, I wonder, Lord, am I building sandcastles with my life? Well, that's a good wonder. That's the first place we need to go, okay? We need to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us if we are doing things that aren't going to advance uh, what he wants in our life and, and being able to stand up and know that we've created the gold and the silver and the precious gems. We need to call the audible. And for some of you that haven't taken growth track, that's your next step. For others, many of you, it's joining a small group, okay? These are the things that God is working in our hearts today. Now bow your heads with me, and I'm going to close this in prayer. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, I thank you for being here. And I ask, Father, that as this moment of silence comes in, that we are able to just let down our guard. So much information. Yes, I thank you that we are your children called by your name. And when we humble ourselves, you direct our steps. Hmm. Yep. So there are some of you that are in this audience, and I'm talking about this confidence of being able to, uh, to know what's going to happen to you when you die. And I get the feel down in my, my soul, there's a shaking like, whoa, wait a minute, I've done a lot of wrong things, and so you're not quite sure, and it's shaky. And so I want to I wanna encourage you to pray with me right now. But before you do that, before you do that, I want you to raise your hand. And these lights are so bright I can't even see. But everybody else has their head bowed. I want you to wave your hand at me so that I know it's you. All right? Mm-hmm. I see that. Yes. Okay. For those of you that acknowledge that you, you want to have that certainty in your life, I'm going to invite you to pray. I'm going to pray up here, but you just pray right where you're at. You just say, Father God. Mm -hmm. Father God, I want to know with 100% certainty that I will be with you in eternity. And so I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior and the forgiver of my sins. In the best way I understand, I ask you now to fill me. And I want to pray for those that, that were praying with me. Father, I thank you. You just told me. You sealed their, their name in, in the book of life. You sealed it in their heart, and you wrote their name in the book of life. Father says that he now knows your name, that when it is your appointed time to stand before him, do not be afraid. Do not let the enemy ever take a moment from you. You will forever be in him. He said, remember, it's never been on your works. It's by the grace of Christ that this will happen. So, Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for those that entered the kingdom of God today. And, Father, I hear you. You said sandcastle. You've been talking to me. Sandcastle building is what so many of your people are doing. So today I invite you to just put your palms straight up where you're sitting. You put them right on your lap. But straight up, because I believe God wants to show you something. If your heart is willing, he will show it to you. So right where you're at, just put your hands palm side up and just put them there. And I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer that I pray all the time. Because I'm not above making sandcastles with my life. You just pray this prayer as I pray it. Oh, Father, search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Ooh. where I have chosen to be my own God, where I have chosen to write the scriptures according to me. Father, I see today that I have been making sandcastles. And so I ask you to forgive me for my sins. And Father, give me strength 
to call the audible in my life. Mm. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd seal that in the people's hearts that were praying that prayer. Father, all life begins with you. All our strength comes from you. And Father, as I pray for myself, I pray for them that you would not only forgive us for our waywardness, Father, but that you would teach us how to find our shape, that we would be, have the, the strength to step over and to step into a, an existence where our shape and the word connect and we make our purpose fulfilled here in this life. I thank you so, Father, for your love. And yes, Father, we will learn to love you with all that we are, with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and with every breath of life that you have given us, Father, we will love you, we will follow you. And with your help, Father, we will love people. We will bring healing in the land, Father, because we will love as you and you alone have shown us to. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Guys, while we're going to get ready to do some transition, for those of you that raised your hand, for those of you that gave your life to Christ, I want you to tell me about it. This is our touchless way of doing it, <laughs> right? You can text 757-704-5504, and in there you can put no God, right? No God, and that'll let me know that you prayed with me. Also, if you want a prayer request, you can also type that into that same number, okay? And for you guys that, because you're here, one of the things, we give you a program. If you want to write out your prayer request, if you want to check off that box you gave your life to Christ, go right ahead and you can put it in the a cylinder as you're leaving. Okay, it'll come to us. And those of you that want to participate with us in our ministry, you can give at 45777 and just put in VCC in the amount that you want to uh, give to, to this ministry. And let me tell you, I was thinking about this before I uh, turn this back over to the, worships, the worship set. You know, when I was in the, the hospital and I was praying for the man to accept Christ, you know, it wasn't me. It was all of you. Everybody that calls this their home, everybody that's participating, helping to uh, bring the tithes into the storehouse, which is this house, right? Actually, it's all of you. So even though I was used as the mouthpiece, it was your heart. And so I believe that it, God, in his wisdom, wrote your name down, each of your names down, and you get credited to that man's salvation. That's how God works with all of us together as a family. Now stand up, and we're going to do some worship. Father, we